Hello, Founders, Futurists, and Failures community. I am your host, Connor Flynn, and today I am delighted to have Joseph Snodder on the show. Joseph is the CEO of Lannister Holdings Incorporated, a publicly traded blockchain technology company. He is also a serial entrepreneur with over 15 years of experience. Our conversation today covers emerging applications of blockchain technology, the Arizona startup ecosystem, and lessons from Joseph's entrepreneurial journey. Our show today is brought to you by Startup Commons as well as Entrepreneurial in an effort to support entrepreneurial best practice sharing. Startup Commons is dedicated to digitizing and connecting startup ecosystems globally to scale entrepreneurship, innovation, and business creation around the world. Startup Commons provides digital connectivity and solutions to enable data-driven economic development and policymaking for local ecosystems. Entrepreneurial works to prepare the next generation of entrepreneurial leaders to improve the world through startups, impact investing, and economic development. Let Entrepreneurial be your guide on your entrepreneurial journey. You can support this podcast by purchasing Founders, Futurists, and Failures t-shirts through the startup shop at entrepreneurial.com. Now, let's hear from Joseph Snyder and learn about Lannister Holdings in the blue oceans of blockchain. What is Lannister Holdings? Why did you decide to start the company? Great question, Connor. Thanks, um, you know, thanks for having me on, and I'm I'm stoked to uh, share some time here with you. You know, Lannister Holdings is a U.S.-based publicly traded blockchain development company, and we decided to start the company. My CTO Chris Brown and I were doing consulting around the tech space and the uh, blockchain development space for a few years, and we're, we're we were having fun with it, but we really felt that at the start of 2018 that blockchain had progressed to a point where it was past just crypto and that the use cases for true disruption in business and systems and government and technology were really really at a precipice of just snowballing and so we decided to form Lannister Holdings as a you know new entity and we did a reverse merger where we acquired a, an existing publicly traded company um, on the US OTC exchange. And so we've completed our reverse merger in the last 60 days. And so we are now a publicly traded uh, blockchain development company based out of Arizona. That's great. One of your focuses is real estate. So what opportunities do you see in real estate markets? We have a lot of experience in real estate as uh, you know, real estate investors, real estate developers, uh, a long history in, in real estate finance and, and property management, real estate investment holdings as a group. And so when we're looking at blockchain from an internal use case, um, our, our focus is on how to um, transact real estate finance on blockchain, on smart contracts and uh, in a decentralized ledger system as well as how to facilitate the backend function of real estate finance, which is all of this, these transactions that happen on the back end of a mortgage, right? So your typical US home loan is a 30 year note. And that note has an average lifespan of about six years. Within that six years, they, the notes get transferred or packaged or sold three or four times. And that process is a, is a very manual sort of a process. And so we believe that utilizing and deploying blockchain and decentralized ledger technologies and token use cases will allow the real estate finance sector to reduce costs, mitigate risk, and transact business in a much more transparent, fluid, and profitable way. And so our goal as a public company is to um, deploy those technologies in the real world. That's one of the reasons that we're based in Arizona, because it's very regulatory friendly to cutting edge tech and specifically blockchain in general. So we are based in Arizona strategically for that reason. And we believe that the opportunities in real estate are absolutely myriad. There are so many points of interaction in a real estate transaction 
from, you know, we, there's companies like Propy, who's based out of Menlo Park, but they have some people in Arizona as well, who, who we've spent a bunch of time with. And they're working on the title transfer side of how blockchain transfers title. They actually just sold the first property, which I believe was a condo in Connecticut. I may be getting the state wrong there, but um, they actually just transacted the first blockchain and, and crypto paid real estate transaction in the US just in the last 60 days. And so there's so many engagement points in the real estate process that have these archaic manual paper systems that can be not just disrupted, not just have reduced costs, but have massively mitigated risk basis for companies and also make the process much more transparent and a lot, lot faster. So it's a very interesting sector. Again, that's our internal focus use case. We are a Lannister development as a subsidiary of Lannister Holdings, currently a trade name, um, is focused on client facing blockchain development in, in the broad scope of use cases. We're, we're working with and talking to companies in manufacturing, logistics, energy, um, healthcare, you know, oil and gas that kind of falls under energy. And, and all of these, you know, really interesting, intricate use cases where you have established, scaled um, systems and companies and processes that there's just a better way. And being able to deploy blockchain from a holistic viewpoint where we as a company are looking at these use cases and helping our clients and our prospective clients to identify where does blockchain fit inside their ecosystem? Where are the disruption points that are ripest for the initial deployments? And then how do those things integrate and overlap and connect with the existing other systems that are there that may not be ready at this point for disruption or, or maybe just, you know, aren't a, you know, a, a blockchain type of a thing, but you still need to have that integration. You still need to have that crossover. And so our ability from the experience that our team has in real world business, bootstrapping, developing, startup, all of that. And being able to engage with the client facing side of this has just opened up just an absolute world of, of possibilities and, and, and power. And it's just, it's, it's an incredible time to be in the space. It's like being in the web space when, when, when Mark Cuban first built his websites, right? Or when Bob Parsons launched GoDaddy and, and you've got this, this sector that's just so ripe for the folks to come in who have real previous business experience. We've taken the hits. We've built things from the ground up. We've, you know, uh, <laughs> pinched pennies and nickels and dimes to put things together. And, and then looking at what is really the core functionality of, of the next generation of Web 3.0. And that's our core belief that blockchain and decentralized ledger technology is the way that the future of transactions, of contracts, and of, of business systemization um, is going to be built on these technologies. And we're standing up and waving the flag and saying, you know what, we are the, as far as we know, um, the only client facing publicly traded US based blockchain development company in existence. And, and we're here to um, work with you as a client, work with your company and find these use cases, find these disruption points, find these value points. As an example, we believe that on the back end of a real estate finance side that we can save between six and 10 points of the cost basis of maintaining and transacting and servicing these loans by deploying blockchain technologies throughout the real estate lending life cycle. And that's a real cost savings, right? That's That could be accretive for a business very, very quickly from uh, looking at a development cost standpoint and saying, well, what does it cost to build this? What does it cost for us to integrate it? What are those pain points? Great, known cost. Now. What does that save us in cash? What does that save us in time and energy? And that doesn't even begin to touch on what does it save in unknown downside risk, right? From the finance company's perspective, unknown, unquantified risk is your biggest thing that would keep you up at night, right? We have all of these actuarial tables and we do all of this work, take insurance for an example, which is an industry that I know quite well. I, I built an, a, a scaled insurance agency over almost a decade and exited a couple of years ago. And the insurance business is all built on this very detailed math problem that really drills down to one or two percentage points at the end of the day. 
And those one or two points at scale and capital add up to a, a nice revenue stream, right? But if you can mitigate some of the cost basis, some of the human um, engagement costs, some of the um, operations costs and the time lag in those systems, and you can add another couple of points, those numbers add up very, very quickly. And the unknown risk associated with human error, transactional error, you know, things like that. As an example, Bank of America bought Countrywide after the crash, right? And then over the next five years, they paid billions of dollars in fines for this portfolio of loans that Countrywide had. Now, some of it had to do with some kind of nefarious practices or whatever you want to call it. And I'm not judging because <laughs> I wasn't there. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were foreclosing sometimes on property that weren't actually supposed to be foreclosed on. They were charging fees on properties that weren't supposed to have those fees charged. And that had to do with the fact that these baskets of loans, these, these securitized bundles of loans, these individual notes that were held um, had been transacted and moved around and they had errors made, um, whether human or computer or however you want to call that, they had these errors made that ended up compounding on themselves, right? And so what they end up with is billions of dollars in, in, in legal costs and fines that really should not have existed if you had a secure, decentralized, verified ledger system to transact those, that business on, right? And so it's a very, very, very interesting, interesting space. I, I don't know if I went too far off the field for your question there, but um, as you can tell, I, I'm a little excited about the prospects. <laughs> Yes, that was wonderful. You provided some excellent examples of improving the ledger system. You know, look, when there's a better mousetrap, there's a better mousetrap. The cream ends up rising to the top. And the question that we faced when we sat down as a team and, and really decided, do we want to plant our flag here? And are we ready to go to market as a publicly traded company and put our face on in the world with this flag? Because, you know, look, I can't plant my flag on crypto right? We're not a crypto company. Yes, we know how to build, you know, token use cases. We know how to build, um, you know, crypto tokens. That's all stuff that's well within our wheelhouse. If, if you are a company that's looking at doing a token launch or a security token offering in the U.S. or, or an offshore offering in, in an unsecuritized way, and, and you need a professional company to come in and, and build your smart contracts, or you need a company to come in and audit the smart contracts that you already had built, make sure that they're secure, make sure that you know things like the ERC-20 bug aren't out haunting you, we're happy to take that phone call. You know, My team will gladly engage with you and, and, and we will give you an amazing world-class experience and, and leave you very, very happy. But we ourselves are not a crypto company. We are a technology development company and, and ideally a finance company as we build those use cases out. But, you know, it's it's a really interesting time to be in the space because as we looked closer and closer at this and as we worked with different clients and different use cases and different things, it became very apparent that um, this ball is just getting started rolling. And the, the industries that this is going to impact and the solutions that these tools are going to provide are um, really, really scaled and powerful. And that is when we decided to say, okay, yeah, let's move forward. Let's do a, you know, let's acquire a public company. Um, let's plant our flag there and, and go forward because now we are looking out at the future and we have a blue ocean in front of us. There's this um, idea about blue ocean versus red ocean in business. A red ocean is where you have lots and lots of competition. It's very cutthroat and the margins are, are slim, right? That's the insurance brokerage industry, <laughs> okay? Right. Right. Um, you know, you're, you're sitting at the office selling progressive insurance and at the same time, progressive spending three hundred million dollars a year marketing to compete with you. Um, that's a red ocean. And in the blockchain development and use case space, um, especially from a security focused mindset. Right. Our CTO, Chris, is ex Air Force intelligence. He's heavily security focused. Our DevSecOps lead, Clifford, is, is a brilliant security analyst 
and who's worked with with massive supercomputing with ASU and, and run all kinds of incredible things. And, um, you know, so our team is very security focused and we're also U.S. based, which at the moment is is kind of rare. Right. A lot of this work is being done, you know, through Eastern Europe or, or through the Asian countries. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But, you know, there's a lot of U.S. companies and there's even a lot of European companies that aren't very interested in going to Eastern Europe or aren't very interested in going offshore because the code really has to be um, secure. And so we're able to um, take those phone calls and facilitate that that business for these folks. And man, it's it's just a beautiful time to be in the blue ocean of blockchain. <laughs> yes. So you were touching on earlier how you're based in Arizona because of the regulatory friendliness. So what are the strengths and weaknesses of the startup ecosystem in Arizona? And how are you all taking a pro-community approach there? That's a great question. You know, Arizona is a very unique um, place because, you know, I personally actually live in California. Um, our team is based in Arizona. Our CTO, our COO, our, our chief of DevSecOps, they're all in, in Phoenix. And, um, and I'm in Phoenix <laughs> about half my life right now. Um, and probably more to come. But, you know, Arizona as a regulatory environment is very unique because they have a appetite for technological risk that does not exist in other places. And as an example, just since we did our merger, and that's probably 60 days ago, the governor of Arizona has signed two or three bills legalizing and, 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 and establishing rules and regulations to support blockchain development in Arizona. They developed a, a, a law for a blockchain sandbox. And what that does is it allows not only access to the government and how blockchain disrupts government systems, which Arizona is very interested in, but it also allows companies like ours to deploy our technologies in the real world for up to 10,000 clients for up to 10 years, or sorry, for up to two years, I'm, I apologize, before having to go register them and, and get them, you know, finished through the approval processes. And so that allows startups to come in and disrupt a space with the legal framework and the legal support and the legislative uh, protection of the local governance. And, you know, I don't need blockchain signatures to be legal everywhere in the world in order to make an impact, but I do need them to be legally recognized within the localized state, county, local government that I'm trying to transact business in, right? right? And so being able to deploy these things within the state of Arizona gives us a, a proven use case in a real world environment that we really couldn't get pretty much anywhere else in the United States at this point in time. Now, other states are trying to catch up, but I think Arizona's got the lead there and we're proud to be based in Arizona. Um, we, we love um, the regulatory environment. We love the startup community. I spend a lot of time in Los Angeles. I spend a lot of time in San Francisco. I'll be in San Francisco all next week meeting with clients. And we have parts of our team, in, two or three members of our team are in New York. You know, we, we do business in London and, you know, Germany. And Arizona has just a little bit different mentality. It's very open. It's very supportive. Like when you go to talk to venture capitalists or you go to engage with business leaders in Los Angeles, it's a, it's a stiff, you know, you better know somebody, mm -hmm. right? Um, in San Francisco, you know, look, you're not just walking in to Menlo Park and knocking on doors and saying, people saying, hey, come on in, tell us about your idea. Like that's not the environment there. And San Francisco is very, very, very pro-tech. In Arizona, um, whether you're in Phoenix or Tempe or anywhere that we've touched in the state, we're able to knock on doors and say, hey, you know what? We're working on this. What are you guys working on? And it's a really positive, inclusive, open environment. You know, we have, uh, you know, amazing folks who have reached out to us from hearing us on podcasts like, you know, the, the blockchain show or Crypto Disrupted or, you know, some of these different things that we're doing. And they reach out to us on, on LinkedIn or through our website, LannisterHoldings.com. Our new website, LannisterDevelopment.com, will be up and finished here in a couple of days. And just say, hey, you know, it looks like you guys are working on interesting stuff. Here's what we're doing. You know, there's a guy, David um, McCarville, who's just an incredible brilliant man and he's a he's a lawyer out of scottsdale 
And, um, you know, he is working with ASU on a blockchain law course for ASU law for next year. Oh, and, wow. and I have breakfast and just, you know, hang out and talk about all these use cases and ideas over coffee. And, and, you know, then he introduces me to three or four other people. And then I send him all this info from these other guys. And, you know, it's just this great, positive, supported communal environment um, that's really supported by a, what I would consider to be from a, from a political standpoint, um, a, a, a risk taking political environment where the politicians are saying, we believe this is the future and we're willing to support it, even though there might be some, you know, m maybe some downsides in, in the meantime. And I don't know that that exists anywhere else right now. So if you are a startup, if you're looking to start up um, a company, uh, I'm in the tech space, obviously. So, so there's that. But, you know, I, I would definitely ask you to look at Arizona. The brilliance of the people coming out of ASU, GCU, even Mesa Community. You know, Mesa Community College has, has launched a blockchain certificate program. We, we've worked with ASU's blockchain department. We've actually done an interview with their blockchain podcast at ASU. Um, same with Grand Canyon University, which is, which is a private university in Arizona. And so the intellectual power and the availability of just vibrant, passionate, uh, in, in, brilliant people coming out of those ecosystems really lends itself to a powerful startup community. And there's some other factors there as well. Cost of living is affordable, right? You can't afford to live in San Francisco. <laughs> no one can. <laughs> Nobody can. You know, the people that live there can't afford to live there. Um, sorry, San Francisco. I love you. I'll be there in a few days. Don't kick me out. But, you know, it's tough, right? New York is very expensive. LA is very expensive. Um, San Diego is horrendously expensive. And so, yeah, is the summer like the surface of the sun sometimes in Phoenix? Sure. But um, other than that, you know, the cost of living is heavily competitive the um openness and 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 support of the government the universities the you know nonprofit sectors and there's a vibrant powerful venture capital base there you've got a lot of these uh, i call them experienced vcs and 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 money folks who spent their time in in silicon valley they spent their time in new york and they uh, are kind of quasi retired <laughs> in in scottsdale or or or, or arizona and you know they end up there because the weather's great most of the year. Um, their dollar goes a heck of a lot farther from a, I don't want to work full time standpoint. And then they still get to kind of play the game and, and be relevant and deal with startups and 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 make some moves. And um, it really creates a very powerful space to work in and very supported. We're we're very happy to be there. Yeah, that sounds like a great ecosystem. It really but, is. So Joseph, you have. 15 years of serial entrepreneurship experience. Could you please share a bit about your journey and the lessons that you've learned? Yeah, I do. That makes me old, I think. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, um, I, I have worked for myself uh, and, and owned the companies that I work with and invest in um, for the last 15, 16 years now. Um, I've done everything from massive success to epic failure <laughs> and everything in between. I, I like to say that, you know, um, I, I'm dumb and the only way I learn things is by pounding my face against the wall as hard as I can and then finding out that that's stupid and don't do that anymore. <laughs> so, um, you know, there is that, but the journey is a journey of learning that the journey is the goal. Um, and you know, there's not a point in, 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 in life or in startups where all of a sudden you've had an exit or you've had some number of revenue, you know, annual run rate or, or my monthly recurring revenue rate, um, depending on the business that you're looking at building. Um, and all of a sudden you've made it right. And then you're done. That does not exist. And, and that was hard for me to learn. And, you know, in my 20s, um, we were phenomenally successful um, to, to the tune of, you know, tens of millions of dollars and, uh, per year in, in real estate, in real estate investing. That was, what, 2003, 2002, 2002, three to 2006, right? And then right. it just slams against <laughs> the, 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 the crash wall and, and everything falls apart. And I personally went bankrupt in 2008. And, you know, that's one of those things where, oh, don't tell people you in Baker. I'm like, bullshit. That's the greatest lesson I ever learned. It's the most expensive PhD in history, <laughs> right? 
you know, and without that lesson, I don't get to be the entrepreneur and the leader and the mentor and the friend that I am today because that guy was focused on the Lambos and Ferraris and getting the jet to Vegas and, and, you know, getting the comp suite and all that shit that doesn't matter. And, you know, I really believed back in that day that ego and, you know, drive and, you know, winning was what this was about and that there was some magical number I was going to hit. And then we were done, you know, and, you know, looking back, you know, on 24 year old, 22 year old Joe, it's like, yeah, that's dumb. (laughs) (laughs) For me, um, I had to learn those lessons, you know, and that sucks because I would much rather, and and my role as a mentor to people on my team and and some folks that are off my team, um, people that I love and respect. And, you know, my role as a mentor to them is to really help them avoid those pitfalls and to, to serve the the younger communities in a way, uh, or the people that are coming up in a way that, that allows them to hopefully learn from some of the lessons that I paid dearly to learn and, you know, cried and bled for. (laughs) And, um, and so that, that, that journey is, is, is a tough one. The, the biggest takeaway that I have from it is number one, there's no end to the game. You know, if, if you want to be a startup, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have got to make a decision that says playing this game is what I want to do. And, you know, from the time I was 12 years old, I wanted to be the CEO of a publicly traded company. And I know not everybody has those goals, uh, but I did. And, you know, I've achieved that goal and I'm not done. I just started, you know, or we've got all the work ahead of us. Right. Right. Um, And so do I celebrate those victories? Absolutely. Revel in them, you know, but also be humble and, and aware enough to realize that that victory is a step on the journey of experiential living. And it's not a milestone where we get to now sit in the, sit in the chair and have the flag wave and, 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 you know, kick our feet up on the beach. I spend plenty of time on the beach, (laughs) you know, and, and, and I love the life that I get to live. You know, I'm sitting here in, in my home in California and I've got some land here. I've got my goats wandering around the field out here in front of me. I've got my husky dogs laying here at my feet and I get to live this, this, this life and I get to experience this journey. And, um, and that is what entrepreneurship is about, because if you are hustling towards some fixed number or some end point that you see in the future, man, I hate to burst your bubble, but uh, it doesn't exist. I I've learned to love the process and that has allowed me to take off. I hope. And, and look, we all struggle with ego, right? We all struggle with hubris and, and stupidity. I know I do. Um, but you know, it's allowed me to, to take that mantle off somewhat and say, you know what, there's just a better way. There's an open communicative, supportive way where I can honor people's magic. You know, I can honor my team's strengths and, and allow the people on the team to focus on their strengths and put other team members in who have different strengths to help mitigate those weaknesses because we all have strengths and weaknesses, right? If you want to buy a company, man, I'm, I'm your guy. I can see all the angles on, uh, and that's hubris. I don't want to be, I don't know everything, trust me, but it's something that I've done several times before. I, I've been successful at it and, you know, there, there's a pattern and a process to it and I know where some of the minds are, right? right. And, but at the same time, you know, if you want somebody to write code, whew, boy, you are not going to get a good result with Joe Snyder. Right. I've got I've got people for that because I can't write a line of code and I run a tech company, but I run the business side of our tech company. Right. I buy the companies that we need to buy. I deal with the SEC. I deal with FINRA. I deal with our attorneys and our accountants and our CFOs and all of our funding structures and all the things that go into making a company um, operationally strong and sound with a solid foundation and successful. And I rely very, very much on the brilliant, passionate, empowered people on my team to make sure that we have the technical prowess that we need to make sure that we deliver the results that we say. And, you know, we have a motto that is, you know, beauty in the details. That idea extends to every part of our organization. If it's time to sweep the floor, I want to sweep that floor with absolutely the best, most detailed, most passionate power that I can and get the best result out of sweeping that floor. 
And if, you know, and, and I like to use Disney as an example of that. If you go to Disneyland, um, walk around that park and, you know, yeah, there's too many people there. We all know. Uh, and they keep raising their prices and still more people come. So they're like, all right, we don't, we don't know what to do. But you will never find a full trash can at Disneyland. I challenge you, go to Disneyland and take a picture and post it on my Twitter, at Lannister CEO, and show me a full overflowing trash can at Disneyland. It's not going to happen because even their janitors absolutely take a massive attention to detail. And that builds a beautiful result for the entire organization. Yes. So it sounds like basically what you're saying is entrepreneurship is a bit of a never-ending journey in self-awareness and that attention to detail is absolutely critical in startups that's absolutely right and and be honest about your weak points you know the problem with ego and the problem that led me to failure uh, with the real estate was not that the real estate market crashed and we were heavily invested in real estate those those were facts Right? Um, right. The problem was that I was not willing to admit where my weaknesses were and bring in beautiful, talented, passionate people who's had those strengths. Right? Because my yeah. ego couldn't allow somebody smarter than me or better than me or faster than me in these areas to come in and, and take those things over. And that's a zero sum game. We, as humans, we cannot be all the things. Right. Um, mm -hmm. My hats go off to single mothers and single fathers because that's a tough gig. You know, my, my mom, you know, raised my little brother essentially uh, as a single mom, you know, for most of that time. And there's a reason that that's a multi person role of, of child rearing because it's very, very hard to fill all of the needs roles that go into that endeavor. And a business is the same way. Without my COO making sure that all of our books are in order and without my CFO making sure that, you know, we're prepared to file our financials correctly and without my CTO making sure that we have the technical capabilities that we have, you know, I can't do my job of dealing, you know, engaging with folks like you and spending the time that I need to spend with our legal teams and spending the time that I need to spend with, you know, negotiating things out for um, payments and contracts and everything else. And it, it's a vital ecosystem, but it really starts with self-awareness and saying, look, I excel here. And we all have something that we excel at, right? Mm -hmm. um, a great book uh, to, to, to reference there is the E-Myth. In the, in the 80s. And, you know, that whole idea is about identifying what, what part of this are you? <laughs> and then how do you get rid of those other pieces, right? Systemize them, build them out, find people, form them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that ideology is really, really strong because as long as we as entrepreneurs try to wear every single hat, we're bound to fail. Right. Yes. Yeah, startups are definitely a team sport. It's a team sport, you know, and a lot of times the visionary is the wrong guy to be running the company. Yes. You know, he needs to be in vision mode and, and get that operations guy in there to deal with the legal structures and deal with the finance structures and take those phone calls and, and handle that stuff. Because, you know, if you're, you know, if you're a visionary in, in healthcare or, or, or some sort of a science and you're over there trying to balance your books, you know, a great example is the dental industry, right? You've got all of these dentists coming out of dental school and, you know, they come out of dental school, they've got a ton of student loan debt. And then right when they get out of dental school, they get approved for millions of dollars in equipment loans and tons of them go bankrupt because they weren't taught an MBA, <laughs> handed a multi-million dollar business operation, right? And that's a full-time job that has nothing to do with drilling on people's teeth. Right. And that's a recipe for failure. Yes, it's very important to have people who have strengths in different areas and can fill all the different roles that a company requires. Yeah, and look, at a startup mode, you know, there's gonna be folks listening that says, well, yeah, but I don't have the money to pay for you. And I said, no, I get it. Now look, when we're in startup mode, you know, and you're grinding, um, there's, there's, there's things that need to be done and you have to wear multiple hats, right? Yes. But if you're conscious top of mind and putting out into the universe what you need, like, hey, I'm willing to wear this hat as long as I need to. Like, I'll scrub, you know, look, I'm 
I'm the CEO of a publicly traded technology company. And that's just cool to say. I'll scrub the toilet today. Like if that needs to be done and that gets us where we need to go and that makes our customer experience better and that leads us to, I don't care. I'll do what needs to be done. Meanwhile, I'm going to be making sure we're looking for a great janitor. Right. <laughs> you know, so do what has to be done today. Wear the hats that you have to wear today, but keep a, a, a focused eye and make sure that you are telling folks what you need, put it out into the world, put it on your social media, you know? And I think that that's a lot of the thing is people are afraid of looking silly or stupid. And that's the greatest thing about going bankrupt for me. I got nothing. There's, there's nowhere else, you know, and, and, you know, we've been successful since then. We built a scaled insurance business. My wife has a very successful e-commerce, you know, <clears throat> we picked up our, from the bootstraps and moved forward. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, we get to live this, this incredible adventure, but take off the thought of looking silly. If you, if you can't look silly on the dance floor, you're not dancing. You know, I was recently in Cartagena, Colombia, and we were at a salsa club and I can't salsa, man. I am, I am, nope. Right. But I'm out there having a great time. I'm like, let's go. You know, and you know, my brother comes down from a floor above me and he's like, you look ridiculous. I'm like, yeah, but I'm having a great time. He's like, get it, get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because the journey doesn't care what it looks like. The journey just cares that you're there to experience it and that you're doing it with passion and the people that you need to support you and the funds that you need and the, the, the love that you need and the, the companionship that a team builds will show up if you are holistically and wholeheartedly attacking those things and, and you are humbly saying, I'll do every single piece of this. I'll do every single piece that I've got to do. We're going to get there. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to keep putting out into the universe, hey, man, I really need a janitor. <laughs> yeah. I really need a great janitor because, man, scrubbing this toilet's taking a lot of time out of my day. But um, got to have the humility to look foolish. Yes. All right. So I think we'll wrap up there. And, yeah, I guess if you need a janitor, people can contact you through the website. <laughs> we We don't, by the way. We are a... Uh, as far as I know, we are the only uh, publicly traded remote work technology company that that uh, in, in Arizona, um, maybe in the U.S. I don't I don't know. And I don't want to overstate, but uh, we're remote work for a reason. I, I know at some point, um, you know, we're going to reach a critical mass where we probably got to have an office full of people, especially on the finance and capital side of things. Um, so some of that's inevitable. But we've built this as a remote work and agile team strategically. Um, on purpose, and it's it's yielded great results. It's it's been an it's been an incredible journey so far, and I, we really look forward to the rest of it. And you know, I hope that we've added some value to your listeners, and and that they can come out of this with a little bit more information or insight or excitement or passion. Um, you know, whatever they take out of it. And if they do want to get a hold of us, um, we are publicly traded on the OTC market under the ticker symbol uh, NBDR, Nancy Bravo Delta Robert. Um, I remember that by like, no big deal, right? Like you just went public, no big deal, right? Um, but, uh, and our website is LannisterHoldings.com. My Twitter is at Lannister CEO. The company uh, Twitter is at Lannister NBDR. So um, any questions or, or anything about blockchain or, or use cases, or if, if your listeners have a, a company that they, you know, do think that fits for, for a, a token offering or, or blockchain use, uh, we, we'd love to talk to them, love to hear from them, love to, love to have those meetings. Wonderful. Well, Joseph, thank you so much for coming on the show. And it's been wonderful chatting with you about blockchain technology and the startup journey. Yeah, thanks for having me, Connor. It was beautiful to meet you.